In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. I will never forget the ordination process to be ordained in Presbyterian Church. You had to take two days of written exams over four years of work. Had to write a paper, an exegetical paper. I did mine on, in Hebrew. Present that to a, an, an examination committee. And then you went before the committee to be examined. I had already received a call before I had graduated, so it was in Dallas, which is Grace Presbytery. And I received a telephone call from the chair of that committee, Dr. Ralph Persons, a former professor of systematic theology at one of the seminaries, Protestant seminaries, a Presbyterian, and he wanted to let me know that um, many candidates did not pass the oral exam on the first try. It was called Grace Presbytery, but after going through the oral exam, I wanted to call it grueling presbytery. And I'll never forget sitting there in, a long, in front of a long table, and they had name plates, many of them professors, former professors, clergy, professors of other fields, the laity, ruling elders. The first question they asked me was, give us an example of the gospel in the Old Testament and the law in the New Testament. And I told them in the Old Testament we could look to the prophet Jonah And in the New Testament, you could look at this portion that I just read, the Sermon on the Mount. And I finally figured out why they called it Grace Presbytery, because it was only by the grace of God that anyone got through their oral exams. Today, I think of a movement in American Christianity, not only in the mainline churches, but in some non-denominational churches also. You might receive one of the handouts or sent through the mail that says, inspiring positive messages, the advertisement says, Or the message of a loved, loving God and no condemnation, another one might say. And certainly this approach to Christianity is partially true, but it is not, in fact, the whole truth. And these mail-outs and the signs we might read around town or even in some of our own churches, reflect the movement of the culture. A culture where everybody wins a trophy. Everybody comes in first place. Christianity has throughout the ages reflected the culture in which it resides. And I personally struggle with writing sermons. Am I too negative? 
Have I been too influenced by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the cost of discipleship? Have I hurt this particular parish by refusing to go along with cultural trends and the latest fads in theology? The current trends are really old trends. There's nothing new under the sun. It's called antinomianism, that there is no law. And we hear often that the God of the Old Testament is a mean God, an angry God, a harsh God. And the God of the New Testament is an easy God, all sweetness and light. The story of a man who is looking for his car keys. Policeman comes by and sees him over there on the ground looking all around. And the police asks, do you need some help? And he said, I sure would appreciate it. I've lost my keys and I can't go home. So both of the policeman and the man are looking all around. And finally, the policeman, after about 10 minutes, says, Are you sure this is where you lost your keys? He said, Oh, no. Oh, no. I didn't lose them here. I I lost them down that dark alley over there. And the policeman said, Why are you looking here? And the man said, Because the light's better here. Am I wrong to think that the way home is to search in the dark places? In the Sermon on the Mount, especially this portion of it, we are encouraged to look in the dark places. Now, we all like the Beatitudes of last week. Oh, that this portion of the Sermon on the Mount, human nature tells us just forget about it. That anger is murder, that lust is adultery. Chopping off hands, gouging out eyeballs. What what happened to the meek and mild Jesus? He certainly doesn't sound very loving. As a matter of fact, I once read a sermon where the author of that sermon said, Jesus being human, Jesus had a bad day. Why does that stick in my craw? I remember a woman in our church coming to me and said, you know, I've got a problem. I kind of got angry. It seems her young son had invited a friend over about four years old, to play. And they were back in his room. And, you know, whenever you have children together and there's silence, that may be a problem. So she goes back there, opens the door, and the two boys had taken Crayolas and had drawn pictures all over the wall. Her son had never done anything like that. 
And she was extremely angry and confronted the mother of the visiting child. Why? What in the world are you teaching your children? And, and she said, we don't want to stifle his creative ability. No rules. And without rules, we end up encroaching upon other human beings' rights. Perhaps the most harmful thing that parents can teach their children is that the wants and desires of the child are the only things that matter. Our lawnmower won't start. So, we bought another one. And that one was only about a couple of years old. It had not done much cutting. And I have come to learn that the less expensive lawnmowers will not burn gasoline with ethanol in them. They don't tell you that. But in order to have it fixed for about three more mowings, talk to my wife about this. She cuts the lawn. You can have it sent back for about the same price as a new mower. However, if you buy the right fuel for about $20 a gallon from the same place, the mower will run. You know, it would be cheaper to run our cars on water, wouldn't it? God who created the engine of life knows what fuel is best to make life run. And if we demand to use something else, Life is not going to run well or run at all. To find a way home, to find our keys, we may have to look in the dark places. And I would propose to you that the dark places will be found in the intent of our actions. Those who heard Jesus' Sermon on the Mount included those who thought they were a cut above. They were in better relationship to God than other human beings. They had a great God report card. They made an A in murder law. They didn't do it. An A plus in adultery. An A minus in lying. An A plus in stealing and the rest of the commandments. They were straight A students. But the intent was in order... In, not to be in relationship with God, but to show everybody how extraordinary they were doing on their report cards that they were truly scholars of God. And every one of them missed the depth and the spirit of the law. The purpose in which it was given. It was given for relationship to God and relationship 
with one another. And they harbored anger and hatred, pride and lust, and the intent of their heart was far from God. Jesus once said of them, you are whitewashed tombs. Man, you look so bright and pretty on the outside, but inside you're full of rotting bones. Oh, sweet Jesus. Let's come back to the lawn. I don't mow the yard. I mowed enough acreage when I was young. And my lovely little wife loves to do it. But let's say my next door neighbor has beautiful flower beds. And one day I'm out and he looks at my yard and he says, You know, all your weeds are creeping over into my flower beds. Why don't you do more yard work? Okay. So I go down to Lowe's and buy some $20 a gallon gasoline. And I go in and say, Honey, I'm going to give you a break today. You need the rest. You've had a hard week. And I'm going to mow the yard. And I fill up that mower with $20 a gallon gasoline, and it starts right up. It is running so well. And then I take the mower to the front yard, and I turn right and run over that guy's flower bed. Now, Was my intent to really get the mower running well? Was my intent to really help my wife out on a Saturday afternoon? Or was my intent to get even with the harsh words of my neighbor? Jesus closes all the loopholes. All those who thought they escaped from being convicted by the law, he just closes it right down. And there was not one person who listened to him who could escape the dark alley of intent. And we who hear this sermon today, I watched your faces when I read it, are uncomfortable. And maybe it is our discomfort in it that we come to know ourselves. And Jesus said, behold, I make all things new. Well, I like that. But if we don't need to be made new, what good is that good news? If we are satisfied with being self-contained, and don't even think we need to be a new creation, What good does Christ do us? Yeah, I'll be the first one to admit that it is, in fact, an uncomfortable venture into the dark recesses of our motives. But that's where the gospel goes. And that's where the healing 
began. And that's where the keys will be found so that we might find our way home. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Let us worship God with God's tithe and our offerings.